Welcome, and glad to have you here this morning. Um, we've been talking in this class about spiritual disciplines, and I understand the teen class has been doing that as well, so I'm a little bit ahead of where you guys are. So um, I have some material here we're going to share on the discipline of simplicity, and uh, most of my material has been coming from Richard Foster's book on discipline of um, spiritual disciplines, but material I have for this particular lesson is uh, largely starts with his material but goes off from what he uh, has. So I think you'll find it useful and it won't be a repeat if you've read the book or if um, Jordan and other people are teaching this class. So um, we want to talk about simplicity. Simplicity is not a word we find in the Bible, but the way that Richard Foster defined it and the way that I've been using it in this class is the idea of trust, of trust in God. And so we want to talk about that. But let's uh, go to our Heavenly Father with a word of prayer to begin. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for your word that helps to instruct us in how we ought to live our lives and who you are and what you have done for us and what you have promised for us. Father, we pray that as we continue in the study of our word, it would help us to put our total trust and, and uh, reliance on you in all things, that we do not need to worry about the things of this world, but to trust that you will take care of us, that all things we can help one another as you have gifted us and helped us and strengthened us, that we can carry out your will and glorify your name and spread your word to the world. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, so when I look at this discipline and I talk about this particular aspect, um, it, it's, I, I talk about it as an outward lifestyle reflecting an inward reality of total trust and dependence upon God. We trust God, we depend upon God um, for everything. Okay? And it's a way of life, if we, if we want to look at kind of a, a verse that exemplifies this, might be Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12. Um, this is Paul writing to the Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12, uh, reading from the NIV, Paul says, I know, Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What do you suppose the secret was that he learned? Nathan? Learning to trust in God. Okay. Yeah, learning to trust in God. Right? Okay, excellent. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Maybe being content. Okay, being content. How, how do you learn to be content? Well, you could accept the circumstances that you're in. And, and working in that circumstance the best you can, that uh, gives honor and glory to God. Okay, except in the circumstance you're in. Okay, good. All right, that's the idea of content. Okay, uh, keeping in our in our thoughts that God is our supply. Okay, God is our supply. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Yeah, I, um, another verse to turn to, um, I don't have it up here, but is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, this is again Paul writing to Corinthians. And I think he, he underscores a couple of things you've been saying uh, here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting verse 8. Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despair even of life. Now, would you like to be in that condition? Things are so bad you think you're just going to die, right? That's what he's saying, okay? Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. It's like, I'm on death row here. I'm going to die, Paul's saying. But, he says, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Right? And he says, all this has happened. He says, I'm in some terrible straits, but it told me I need to trust God. He's going to get me through. And he goes on then. He says, he has delivered us. That's God has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and we, he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by our prayers. When we pray for missionaries, we pray for one another. We're helping each other to get through those circumstances that are difficult to deal with. And that's what Paul was doing. Um, and he knew that God was going to take care of him. So he could be, whether he was well fed or he was hungry, he had plenty to go on or very little, he could be content knowing God would take care of him. And this is the idea when we talk about simplicity, trusting in God for everything. Okay? 
The opposite might be a life of greed or reliance upon ourselves or, the, or other people or things. I mean, as children growing up, you rely on your parents for about everything, right? But as you get older, you start getting your own responsibility and you start taking care of things on your own, right? And as an adult, you become responsible for everything. But even as adults, we depend upon God because he's the one that really supplies everything we need, right? Okay. So this is what we're talking about, okay? And a key to this whole thing is found in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This is the Sermon on the Mount, very well-known passage that a lot of people are very familiar with. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Right? What are all these things? He says, all these things be given to you. What are all these things he's going to give us? Anybody know? Yeah, Keith? Uh, the things that we normally associate with security. Okay. Things we normally associate with security, such as? Um, Verse money. 31. Yeah. Money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Food, clothing, shelter. Exactly. Let's back up and look at verses 25 through 32, and I think this will give us insight, right? He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Or, for pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what are these things he's talking about? Nathan? The stuff that we do necessary yeah things necessary for life food and drink and clothing right the things that sort of sustain life they'll provide so why do we worry about them yeah yeah but we do right we're always running after these things okay so when we talk about this this idea of trusting in god there's about four things i want to kind of put in our minds that we want to recognize about god okay the first is the superiority of God, that he is he's better than anybody else in this world providing for us, right? Um, our parents can provide a lot of things, friends provide a lot of things, but God is vastly superior. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. There's other verses we can look at to illustrate these points, but I want to um, use these just to remind us of things we know. This is Paul writing to the Philippians again, and he's talking about what he used to have. And look at what he has to say here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. Okay? He says, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness come, that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul was a very rich man at one point. He said he gave all that up because it was better to know Christ, because there's eternal rewards to it, right? Okay. So God is vastly superior. Everything we have comes from God, right? He's provided everything, okay? And realizing the gift of God, I mean, we talk about eternal life, 
But really, God provides us with everything we need. In First Peter chapter, or Second Peter, excuse me, chapter two. Second Peter chapter one. We'll get it right here, verses three and four. Um, Peter writing says, "His divine power, is God's divine power, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness." Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. What do we have that we don't get from God? Anything? It doesn't even give us everything we need, right? So, what more do we need? We've got God, and he supplies our every need, yeah. Uh, the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, what do you have that was not given to you? Yeah. What do you have that wasn't given to you? Right? Everything comes from God. Right? Okay. So realize he's given us this gift. Now the other, the flip side of this that I think is quite interesting to me is if we turn back just a couple of pages into 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11, we often think about um, when you, th when you hear the word grace and God has given us grace, what do you think about? Forgiving us for our sins. Okay, forgiving us for our sins. Okay. All right. Anything else? A quiet bunch today. Yeah. Yeah. We have Anything to that we haven't earned yeah. he, that he gives us. Yeah, things that we've not earned, he's given us. I mean, he's given us freely uh, of all things, right? He gives to us, right? And we often think of grace in that term of what God has given to us. But look at what he says here in Second in First Peter chapter 4. He says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Do you ever think that the fact that God has given you abilities and experiences that you can share with other people, you're actually sharing God's grace with other people? Do you ever think about that? Yeah. I mean, that's what Peter's saying. God has shared with you so that you can share it with others, and you're effectively, you're sharing God's grace with other people when you're going around and helping people out and teaching people and doing things. Kind of cool, right? Yeah, okay. So part of trusting God, he'll provide what we need so we can help other people. Okay, now this last one, we're going to spend quite a bit of time when we get into um, this particular topic. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. We're kind of right there. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God cares about us. It actually kind of goes back to the Sermon on the Mount we just read. It said, do not worry. Remember what he said about the birds of the field? Birds of the air? Did God care about them? Yeah. Uh, it said that we're even more valuable. So therefore, God care that much more for us and provide that much more than what he already gives yeah. to the birds. Yeah, exactly. If, if God cares for the bird and we're much more valuable than they can, we're creating his image. If he cares for them, won't he care for you? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so he cares about us. He cares about our needs. He cares and he knows what we need. So we don't need to be anxious. But this is where I want to try and spend some time is talking about this idea of God's care, okay? All right. So I want to talk about this idea, because in that verse right that we just read there, it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. What, what's the difference, do you think, between worry or anxiety and care and concern? You ever thought about trying to define those? Are they, are they different in any way? Hmm. What do you think? Care and concern is acknowledging an issue 
in, in actively seeking a solution, okay. but not letting it control your every movement of the day. That would be anxiety, but it controls your every action and your everything you do is centered around this knowledge of this issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That you have something that's you need to deal with, but you're you're taking care of it. It's not just overriding your your daily routine and so forth. Okay. Uh, would care and concern be with God in the picture? But worry and anxiety would be without God in the picture. That, that could be one way of looking at it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like it. Um, yeah, we, we read, well, we actually did not read Matthew 6, 34, which says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Right on the heels of verse 33, which told us to seek God's kingdom first. I found this quote, too, that I thought was interesting. It says, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. I thought that was kind of cool. Kind of like Chris was just talking about, when we start worrying about things, it's taking away from what we can be doing today, right? It's consuming our thoughts and minds. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at a, don't need to remember the Greek, but I'm just going to give you a couple of Greek terms just to help us to see this difference and talk about this. Um, so in the Bible, when it, it translates, oftentimes it'll translate worry or anxiety. It comes from this Greek word, uh, marinma, uh, means a distracting care or to draw in different directions, right? Um, and that's really kind of what it's looking at. And actually, I think, um, I remember seeing a, uh, a Spanish translation of this word in some place, and it used the word preoccupado, which brings to our mind yet yeah, preoccupied. And that's the idea. When we're worried about something, we're preoccupied with that when we should be dealing with something else. It's distracting us, right? Because we're, we're cons constantly thinking about it when there's other things we should be doing. That's kind of the idea of worry and anxiety, right? What are some things today that we worry about? Or do you not worry about anything? I know something I always worry about is whenever I'm doing a sport, I always get really nervous and worried about how I'm going to do in the next competition. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So sports competition, you worry about anxiety. How am I going to perform? Am I going to be able to do, to do my job well? Okay, good. All right. Others? Uh, at school, I like worry about like tests and stuff. Like how well oh. do on the test? Oh yeah, a lot of students worry about tests. They're going to be able to remember the answers. They're going to be able to do the problems exactly. Yeah, we have you know I'm teaching at the college and uh, yeah, I get a lot of students very very anxious about test taking. They know the material, but they become anxious and they don't do as well as they think they should. Okay, good. All right, others. Do I have enough time in the day? Okay, do you have enough time in the day? Okay, got a lot to do, a lot to get accomplished. Okay, all right, others. Passing my arborist exam. Okay, <laughs> right, yeah. Even as adults, sometimes we have to pass tests, right? Okay. Yeah, I took two of them on Friday. Yeah, okay. Good. Well, we pray it all went well for you. I'm sure if you studied, you did well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think we can probably all relate to the fact there are probably different things that we do worry about, right? Things that come up in our life. But what do we do about them, right? And this is the idea of, of simplicity, of trusting in God, right, uh, to get us through these things. Um, we can look at, we've already looked at 1 Peter 5, 7, which tells, you know, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, right? Um, but how are we going to do that? How do you cast your anxiety on God? Emily? Prayer. Prayer, yeah. Turn to Philippians chapter 4, right? Philippians chapter 4. You ask good questions. Yeah. Okay. And the Bible gives us good answers, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're here for. All right. Okay. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 6, and we'll go on through verse 7, at least through verse 7. Do not be anxious about anything. There we go. That's that same word we just saw. Don't be anxious about anything, but instead, in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, and was right, pray. Okay? How many of us take time to pray when we're worried about something? Do you pray before you take a test? Do you pray before you go out and do a sports thing? Do you pray about your day and all the things you have to do, right? Okay? So, pray, right? Whether things are going bad or going well, whether you've got things that are heavy on your mind, whether you're not, pray, right? And talk to God about it, okay? This is how we cast our care and anxiety on God. Take it to God in prayer. Um, he cares for us. He knows what's going on. And this is exactly what we saw in Matthew chapter 6, 25 and 28. This again goes back to the Sermon Mount we just read at the beginning of class. It talks about why do you worry about clothing? Why do you worry about what you're going to eat? God will take care of you. But what was the secret to him providing all those things? Verse 33 in Matthew 6. Remember? Yeah, to trust in the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Trust in the kingdom, but what was it, Emily? To ask. Okay, ask. Okay. The word that was used there in Matthew 6, 33 is seek. Mm. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Right? So we're putting God first. I mean, that's the idea of the simplicity and trusting in God. Put him first. Right? So in the start of your day, go to God in prayer or read his word or think about him. Put him first. And he'll take care of all these things. Right? That's what Paul learned. Right? Um, he was in prison when he wrote Philippians. Just, I can rejoice even in prison. You know, because he knew God was taking care of him. Okay? So this is the idea. Okay? Help us get through worry. Right. The idea of care or concern, uh, Greek word mellow, there's other derivatives of it too, but this means something of an object of care, especially of forethought and interest. This kind of gets back to what Chris was talking about earlier. Do you know that there's something in your life you need to take care of, something's coming up, but you're dealing with it, you're planning a way to take care of it. This gets the idea of planning. This gets the idea of training. That when things come up, you've already got a way to take care of it, right? And, you're and God takes care of it, okay? Well, some people say, now, wait a minute, Gene. Doesn't God take care of all of our needs? Why do I need to plan? Why, do I, why should I do all these things? Won't God take care of me? Is it wrong to plan? In James, it says you have not because you ask not. Okay. Yeah, yeah James 4 will say you have not because you do not ask. But it also says when you ask, you ask for your wrong motives, spend it on your own pleasures, right? Sure. Instead of what God wants, okay? Um, but also in James 4, um, I think I've got it later in my notes, but while we're there, let's go to James chapter 4. We talk about planning a little bit. I want to talk about this for a few minutes. James chapter 4, verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Okay. He's telling you it's not bad to plan, but don't leave God out of it. Right? If it's God's will, we can do these things. Um, but this is also the chapter that we we're just referring to that says, um, verse 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. You spend what you get on your own pleasures. Okay. So, yes. Uh, Tyler asks, how do we reconcile suffering and trials with God taking care of us? Oh, excellent question, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that answer can be found in what we read at the beginning of class in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul was under tremendous suffering, but he realized that suffering was drawing him to trust and depend upon God. And so sometimes God allows us to go through a lot of trials and so forth because it helps us to grow and develop. In fact, in, while we're in the book of James, go to James chapter 1 and verses 2 through 4 in particular. 
and we could read five as well. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work, so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, God allows us to go through suffering and some trials, but there's a purpose to it. It can help us to grow, help us to develop that faith in him, to trust in him. He is going to take care of us. Paul realized that. That's why he could write those words. God's taking care of me through all sorts of things. And even though I know I've got more battles ahead of me, I know God's there with me. He'll take care of me. Yeah. So, Because God doesn't promise we won't have them. He just promised to be there with us and help us to get through them. Right? So we can trust him. Because he's done that for his people. Right? Okay. I hope that helps, Tyler. So, okay. Because he does care about us. Yeah. But... Oftentimes, these things help us to grow and depend to trust Him. Okay. All right. Um, we've looked at 1 Peter 5 7 a couple times, and we've also looked at 1 Peter 1 3 through 5, where it says that God provides all things for us. But let's go to John um, chapter 10 and verse 13. It's just another example of God's care for us. Um, in this passage, Jesus is speaking, and he's talking about the, he is the shepherd, and in verse, we'll read verse 11 through 13. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. When the, then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. There's our word care. Shepherd, this, in this case, that shepherd doesn't care about the sheep. He only cares about himself. But Jesus cares about us. And he'll take care of us. He's the good shepherd. He'll take care of us. Right? So we can trust him. Okay? Um, he'll help us to get through. He cares about us. All right? Okay. So I, I look at this, this difference between care, concern, wor worry, and anxiety. Care and concern involves providing for or planning ahead, while worry or anxiety involves being distracted by or preoccupied with what could happen or is happening or should have been cared for already, right? So, for instance, we got a test coming up. Have you studied? Have you been doing your homework all along? If you've been doing the work, the test shouldn't be a big job, problem for you, right? Okay. If you're going out for a wrestling match, but you've been practicing and knowing all the moves, when you get there, you know what to do. I mean, that's why the Army and, you know, and Marines and everything, they put people through training. When they get to the real thing, they know what to do. Firemen and so forth, they're put through training. Policemen and so forth, right? We all go through training so that we get to the real situations. We know what to do. We can handle it. We don't have to worry about how to deal with it, right? So this is the idea of care and concerns. We know that there are things that we need to take care of. We need to know we take care of our family, right? And so we, we go out and we find work to help provide money to take care of our family. God gives us the ability to do that. If we can't work, but we're trusting in God, putting him first, God still cares for us, right? He tells us that we're to care for the poor. And we look at the New Testament Christians. Um, turn to Acts chapter 2. You know, we talk about um, you know, God caring for us, and we also read in 1 Peter 4.10 about that God's grace is shared through us. And in Acts chapter 2, um, look at about verse 40, I'll go from 42 through about 45. Um, they, they, it says, they is the, the new Christians there, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wondrous and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added their number daily, those who were being saved. What I want to emphasize in there is they took care of each other. God had provided one family with lots of things. Somebody else didn't have hardly anything. Those who had plenty shared with those that didn't. 
God was taken care of, right? Um, so, you know, whether we're able to work, if we're able to work, we should. If we're not able, God takes care of us and put him first, okay? So this idea of planning um, is important. Do you think God did any planning? Yeah. Well, multiple times when Jesus speaks to his apostles and everyone, he refers to everything being a part of God's plan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, throughout the Old Testament, God is revealing a plan he's put together since the beginning of time. Before he even created this, he knew that he's going to have to send Jesus, right? He planned that all from the beginning. So God plans. Should what? We plan as well? Okay. Because um, this is what the idea of care and concern, that we know there are things we have to take care of, so we plan for them, we provide for them, so that we don't need to worry about things. And we know that God provides what we need to be able to get through these things, okay? So we don't need to be worrying about them, okay? But we get distracted a lot, right? Now, this is another kind of concept I want to talk about a little bit along this as well. Um, you know, this little cartoon up here, you know, managing distractions, messaging, emails, personal distractions, coworkers, pressure, complacency, uh, the web. You know, I mean, if we spend time on the web, um, I find it very easy to start doing like YouTube shorts or Instagram stuff, and you can be distracted and spend lots of time on there very easily, right? Uh, we find all sorts of things to distract us, right? Um, you know, or checking our emails or checking text messages or whatever, right? Um, you know, or even our, our job, the pressure of our jobs and so forth can be that, okay? But all sorts of distractions. And I want to look at this parable that we're probably familiar with from Matthew chapter 13 and talk about this same idea about trusting in God, putting God first, okay? In Matthew chapter 13, you're probably familiar with the parable of the sower and the seed, uh, starting in verse 3. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. When the sun came up, the plants were scorched. They withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell in good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, if you're familiar with this parable, what were the soils? Okay. There was the rocky ground. Okay. Okay. The one with weeds. Okay. Um, there was one that got too much sun. Okay. And then there was just a good soil. A good soil. Okay. Yeah. So you had the kind of the hard beaten path. We got sun. So the seed that fell on it didn't even get a chance to sprout. You had the kind of rocky soil was kind of shallow when it sprouted up and the things, the sun beat down and the <clears throat> seed died. Then you had some soil that the seed sprouted, but then weeds came up and kind of choked it out. Then you had the good soil where it produced a big crop. What did those things represent? Remember what Jesus said they represented? It's the word of God and how hearts receive it. Okay, yeah, so the seed is the word of God, he goes on to tell us, right? Um, down in verse, uh, let's see, starting there, in, um, I should have put this in my notes. Yeah, starting about verse uh, 18. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. That's the seed sown along the path, right? So the seed is the word of God, and what's happened is men's heart. So the hard path is like it was sown there, doesn't even make, doesn't make root. Verse 20, the one who received the seed that fell in the rocky places is a man who hears the word once receives with joy, but since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. He's not grounded real well, and he can't handle it. But verse 22 is the key to our discussion here today. Listen to what it says. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, 
but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Right? So when we start worrying about the things of this life, when we get distracted by the things in this life, or the deceitfulness of wealth, or going after wealth, what does it do to us? takes away from God, keeps from being productive, does it not? Right? So we got to, you know, watch out for what's distracting us. What are we worrying about? And why are we worrying about it? Right? Because uh, taking us away from God, taking away from being productive, being fruitful for God. Okay? There's a really good um, example of this in Luke chapter 10. Turn over to the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. You've probably seen this before, but it illustrates our point really well here. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 and following. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where um, a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried about and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what's better, and it will not be taken away from her. Well, that speaks to writing that we're talking about, doesn't it, right? What was, what was um, Mary doing? Listening to Jesus. Yeah, listening to Jesus, right? And what was Martha doing? Okay. Like preparing food and just you know, running around cleaning. Okay. Stuff. Yeah, have you ever done that? Have you ever, your parents ever done that? They're like, oh, we got to get this cleaned up. Got to get this done, right? Yeah. Getting all these things, we get distracted, we get, you know, tied up in doing all these things. And, and Jesus told Martha, says, you're worried about a lot of things. But what's really needed right now is you need to sit and listen. Right? And that's, that's us, isn't it, sometimes? We get distracted doing all sorts of things. Um, and sometimes we need to remember what's first, putting God first. Right? Um, and if we put God first, everything else should fall into line. He'll provide for us. Yeah, we don't need to worry about these things. Okay. So, yeah. So we can overcome a lot of our worry with planning, with preparation, right? Got this little diagram here. We plan, we go out and do, check to see how it's working, and then and we act, okay? And then we can modify. It's not working, change our routines or whatever, okay? Um, another example, let's take a look at Acts chapter 6 and the first few verses. Acts chapter 6. Verses 1 through 4 in particular. It said, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So here's a worry, here's a concern. Wait, some widows aren't getting food. We're not getting taken care of them. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Okay, so here's a problem, right? Widows are not being fed, and they brought it to the apostles' attention, and the apostles are saying, "What? Uh oh, we got to We got to. How are we going to take care of this? Right? What do they do? They created a plan of how they would deal with it. Okay. Yeah, they came up with a plan, right? Let's get seven men to take care of this responsibility. Why were they going to turn it over to seven men? Why didn't they do it? They had their own responsibility. They had their own responsibility, right? Their own priorities, what they were supposed to be doing, right? They didn't need to be distracted by, by doing the work of taking care of the widows when they're supposed to be ministering the Word of God, right? Did somebody else do that? Yeah. They were called 
to minister. They were called to minister the word. Follow right? their calling. Yeah, exactly. And this goes into, you know, we've talked about in this class, the last few weeks, we've talked about the idea of service. That each of us is called by God to serve in different ways. Not everybody's going to be a preacher. Not everybody's going to be a teacher. Some people are going to be doing little things and helping and serving. Other people are going to be leaders and so forth. But we all use those gifts to help the body. Right? And this is what's going on here in Acts chapter 6. We have some that are called to prayer and ministry of the word. Others were called to help serve widows. But the whole body gets taken care of. God takes care of things. But they came up with a plan. They carried it out. Okay, good. All right. Um, we've already read these verses from James chapter 4, talking about it when we do our planning, do it within the will of God. Make sure what we do is consistent with God's will, but also keep in mind that sometimes God's got his own plans, right? Um, we may plan for certain things and they don't fall, come out. Um, some of you probably know that uh, my family and I, we were planning to go to Tennessee back in October. We had a vacation all lined up. The day before we were supposed to leave, Carolyn came down with COVID and we had to scrap the plans. You know, wow. So yeah, so plans change, right? <laughs> um, but I didn't let it worry me because, okay, maybe there was a reason God didn't want me going. And we ended up being able to come to a couple of events we were going to miss. So we were able to take advantage of them, right? So I didn't worry about, oh, what am I gonna do now? But I'd also, this also gets back to the planning. In when I planned that trip, I had bought insurance for our hotel stay. So I really wasn't out any money, right? So we took care of that. So I didn't need to worry, oh man, I'm out thousands of dollars on this trip. No, because I took care of it, right? That's the idea that we use what God's given us, our talents, our time, our abilities, to think forward, think about what could happen and how, do we, how are we gonna take care of it? When things don't go right, they're, they're covered and I don't need to worry about it. And I know that God has taken, you know, provided for us. He provides a way for us to buy insurance and do these kind of things, okay? All right. Um, here's another example. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, um, verses one and two. Now in this, Paul is addressing a question that had come up. Uh, much of this 1 Corinthians, he's addressing questions that had come up. And a question had come up, well, what do we do about collecting money for God's people? We said we'd help out, but now what do we do? And here's what Paul wrote. He says, now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian church to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So, oh, the plan. Every week, we just put a little bit in every week and then when Paul gets there, it's already there. It's already taken care of, right? So we don't need to worry about it. That's the idea, okay? That we make plans and we can carry them out. Um, so we don't need to worry about things. God's given us the ability. And obviously God has um, plan, made plans as well. Now we've also, we've already read this about Philippians 4, 6 through 8 about prayer. Um, we don't want to do anything without praying to God. And that's what Philippians 4, 6 through 8 reminded us. In everything, take your request to God. With thanksgiving, right? Um, and you see this, and I didn't put this in my notes, but do you remember what Jesus did before he went out and picked his 12 apostles? What did he do? Emily? Pray. And yeah, he went out and spent the night in prayer before he picked his apostles. Right? So, yeah. So, prayer is a key part. We want to keep ourselves from worrying. We want to keep God first. Go to God in prayer. Start with prayer. Um, many, many years ago, I was leading BBS, and I was having trouble finding enough teachers to lead BBS. And I finally, this is within about a couple of weeks of BBS voting to be going on, I finally prayed. I prayed to God, I said, Lord, I, we don't have enough teachers. What are we going to have? Within four or five days, I had enough teachers and beyond. Why didn't I start with prayer, right? <laughs> That's a lesson I learned. Start with prayer, not end there. We sometimes wait till we get in trouble before we got to God in prayer. No, start with prayer first. And then we don't have to worry about these things, right? That's the idea of simplicity, a day of trusting in God. Put him first. Ask him. He cares for us. He'll provide for us. All right. Okay. Um, I've got this little, see if this shows up, a little short video here, um, 16 seconds, about this teens trying to overcome distractions. Let's see if this shows up. Um, Get a little 
causing so many distractions. How do you stop yourself getting distracted? Not getting distracted is incredibly difficult. I delete all my social media apps during the week, and then I do calendar blocks with big tasks that I'm procrastinating with. I make sure that I have enough time for it, and I just tick it off. Okay. What do you think about people that okay. complain all the time? Yeah. Chances are... Okay. Yeah, there's one person's solution. He just gets rid of all the social media during the week. <laughs> then on the weekend, he spends time doing that. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's, you know, for everybody, but the point I'm trying to make is we need to find ways for us to overcome the distractions and things that worry us and trust in God, okay? Um, I think about you, Emily, and trying to make sure you've got enough stuff to do in the day. You know, for me, I usually have like a, a to-do list. I've got a weekly to-do list, and I actually divide it out by days, and I actually put in there how much time I think it's going to take me to do those things. So I make sure I've got enough time for them, right? Now, my estimates of time sometimes are way off. Other things came up, you know, um, and so I've got to replan. But at least it gives me a way to look forward on what I'm trying to take care of. Yeah. Okay. Um, especially when you get really busy, you know, trying to block out, can I do this all? Okay. Um, but finding ways to try and overcome distractions. Anybody else have ways that you try and overcome distractions or deal with them? Setting at a certain time at night, I'm going to turn, I'm not going to get my social medias or, you know. Yeah. Turn off the TV. Turn off the TV, yeah. TV is a great distraction, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things that distract, a lot of things that worry us in this life, and we don't need to um, be worried about it because we can go to God in prayer and nobody takes care of us. Let's, uh, well, thank you for your participation. Let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for your word that helps us to know that you indeed do care for us. And we pray, Father, that you help us to take the time and opportunity, the things you've given us, to help us to plan and prepare for, the, for life, the things that life throws at us, knowing that you, no matter what happens, you are with us and you care for us and provide for all of our needs that we don't need to, to worry about these things, particularly the necessities of life, but that we can help other people to get through, to grow, and to be encouraged. And Father, may your word always be in our hearts and our minds as we strive to do your will. And we're thankful of what you've done for us. May we share those blessings with those around us. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone.